And good evening everyone and welcome to our weekend wrap show. Joining me as usual we have Maka and a sick Nikki. How are we going guys? <laughs> I'm okay. Oh, I'm I'm okay because we won. Yeah, it was pretty solid uh, and uh, we'll have a bit to talk about I'm sure. So uh, <clears throat> let's get right into the weekend's results and it was on Friday night uh, GWS giving Western Bulldogs a bit of a touch up in the end after an even first half, one hundred five to fifty seven. Is is that the end for the Bulldogs? Do we think? Well, I'd hope so because on, on that performance, they're not good enough to be in the finals. Well, apparently not quite. I think they could. St- there's a still possibility, depending on some results, they could make it. But I think it pretty much was shutting the door on them. If they do, it'll be a um, I think a first game out scenario. Yeah, they don't look a shadow of the team that they were last year and it just shows you what momentum can do for a side, doesn't it? Yep, sure does. On Saturday we had uh, Sydney absolutely destroying Fremantle, 143-39, uh, a margin of quite a bit, what's that, 94 points and uh, Sydney have won 12 of their last 14, I think. Yeah, they yeah. have, and that was a record loss um, to Ross Lyons, but that was, they just beat, I think it was by three points, they just beat our score against them, which was previous to that, his record loss. Yeah, well, I must admit, uh, that that was a massacre, and it should be, uh, if there's a major threat to us winning a premiership this year, it should be. Well, I'm going to be interesting, and I don't want to get ahead of the discussion, but it'll be interesting to see uh, whether next week's result means anything with uh, a couple of outs for us. Anyway, moving on. Richmond managed to lose a game they really should have won. Uh, Geelong, 80 to Richmond, 66, so a margin of 14 points. Richmond uh, just burnt themselves. They, they should have beaten Geelong in this game. Yeah, but I hope, I hope to God they are the mob we play in a home uh, first final because... Uh, they, they they just manage, as you said, to beat themselves. You don't have to do it. Oh, that was just shocking to watch. I actually had tipped Richmond, and then on the day I thought about it and went, no, hang on. Revolt actually causes them issues up forward because they just become too focused on him, whereas they've been playing so well without him. And I was like, oh, should I change my tip? And I didn't, and I bloody well should have. Actually, what you said sounds crazy, Nicky, but it's quite right. They do... They are over-focused, on, and then they were over-focused on him. What do you think about Hardwick's comments, and, and Vardy Magic brings it up in the chat, and to get out of those people in the chat. Hardwick's comments after the game about the umpiring, I thought were terribly overblown, considering his team actually d- deserved the blowtorch far more than the umpires. Well, I, I, I presume he's saying that Geelong got a good hand, and they do generally get a good hand down on that ground, but I don't think that was the difference. Well, in the first quarter, it was going Richmond's way, not Geelong's. So I don't see what he's um, complaining about unless he's just trying to take the Cockwomble nomination for this week away from Tom Lynch. Well, it was 20 to 7 free kicks at half time, and yet watching the game, you didn't feel as if uh, Geelong were getting much of the rub of the green. Uh, I think it was just that they were. They were getting themselves in positions to win the ball and win free kicks. And uh, Hardwick, on the other hand, saw it differently and invoked the old, uh, you know, home crowd and all the rest of it. To his credit, though, he did uh, acknowledge that Richmond have a similar thing when they play at the G. But I, I just felt like it was actually deflecting blame away from his team when his team really should have done better. Yeah, they should have done better because they they will never get Geelong in a weaker state than that. You know, without their full forward and without the two key midfielders, and we're talking about two very good midfielders that were out. Um, admittedly, they had one uh, get injured during the course of the game, um, but that's still no excuse. I, Geelong were in a weakened state, and they were there to be taken. Yep, opportunity lost. Anyway, uh, Brisbane, after a uh, uh, a very close uh, first section of the game, ran away with it to the tune of 58 points over Gold Coast. Brisbane 142 uh, to Gold Coast 84. 
Dane Bean's playing really well. Tommy Rockcliffe playing well under emotional duress. And uh, I reckon Brisbane will be on the improve next season. Hard to, hard to read the Gold Coast, though, with uh, Solomon in charge. Well, you got you got a situation. Brisbane Lions, uh, as I said last week, I took back my comments about them being hopeless because they do have a future because they've got, got, they've got a lot of good young lads. Um Gold Coast, though, uh, mate, I know that they didn't have Tommy Lynch, uh, and he's and he's a star. But uh, major concerns, I think, because they just they just fell away to nothing. Um, and you know, Nablet has got a hamstring. He hasn't got a hamstring. He played. He doesn't play. Um, very strange in situation with him, I think. But having said that, um, now the rumour is that again, uh, some of you stated on radio, TV that. Um, Tommy Rock is Adelaide bound. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Well, we do need... Sorry, Nicky, we do need... Oh, well, you don't need, but I reckon we could do with just a touch of class uh, to go with the uh, workhorses that we currently have in the midfield, and uh, Tommy Rockcliffe would be a welcome addition, I reckon. Uh, and interestingly, they've been playing him out of the midfield over the last month or so, almost as if they're preparing themselves for that eventuation. Yeah, he's been playing much more time up forward. There's no doubt about that. Uh, one, another reason for that might well be that um, he did his shoulder when tackling some weeks back, and I have noticed that since his return, he hasn't been doing very many tackles. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, yeah that's an interesting point, Marker. I hadn't picked up on that one. Yeah, not sure about that one. Uh, anyway, moving along, West Coast struggle to overcome Carlton at Domain, uh, eventually 183 on the back of some Kennedy brilliance. Uh, they don't look convincing at all, although they'll probably limp into the eight. Yeah. yeah. Although somebody, I think, pointed out that it could be a possibility, of depending where you know where Port finishes, it could be like a Port West Coast final. And I'd actually back West Coast. To actually win that one at Adelaide Oval. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, West Coast, ordinary side, and so poor, but uh, we're talking about West Coast here with Carlton. I mean, Carlton are right down the bottom, and uh, Carlton are, have. Uh, They're no muds, the, though. Yeah, but they're playing a lot of young boys as well. And, you know, I just think that West Coast, they're not a good side. They, they revolve around Kennedy, and if they've got no Kennedy, they've got no show. I know. They, they, there's no flag there. You wouldn't have thought so with the current squad, Macca. Uh, I reckon there's uh, a bit of churning to go on over the next season or two uh, with that club. Uh, Melbourne did what they had to do against Sydney, uh, St Kilda, sorry, uh, getting over the line ninety six to seventy two. I didn't see the game, but uh, you know, credit to Melbourne that the game that they had to win is usually the one that they drop, and uh, they beat the only other team outside of the eight that really has a shot. Of getting there, so uh, if they keep going, they'll I, be in the, I, in the I, final. I, I saw that one, Phoenix, and um, yeah, you should have watched it because you wouldn't have said what you just said if you had a. Basically, if St Kilda could kick straight, and they were shocking at it, um, they should have won, and they weren't playing well. Melbourne were not convincing at all. Yeah, I, I watched some of it because I, I couldn't stand watching it anymore. Oh, it was horrible. It was a very low standard game. Melbourne guts it out to win it. I, I, that's, I'd say that's the best way to put it. They they just, in my opinion, uh, Nicky, I, I just thought they out gutsed St Kilda. Yeah, just towards the, that ending bit. But if the Saints had been able to nail a couple of those shots, which they had, which weren't too hard, yeah, I think it would have been a vastly different result. Well, nevertheless, in the end, Melbourne got the result, and that's the result that they needed, and they stay in the hunt. Uh, today, uh, also, we had Hawthorne getting over North Melbourne, uh, both teams out of the race. Uh, that was Luke Hodges' last game in Tassie, so I suppose the Hawks wanted to do it for him. And at Adelaide Oval, we had Port, unconvincingly, I thought, getting over Collingwood, 98-71. to Margin of 27 points keeps them in fifth, but I think it still inflates their position on the ladder. Well, to, from my point of view, if there's any doubt on whether the Buckley should be reappointed or not, having watched that game, there's no way he should be appointed, reappointed. In that, that first half, 
the game plan that they used, which was hang on the ball, kick sideways, backwards, but don't, don't dare go attacking. And, of course, they eventually turned the ball over and, 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 and get a score. But um, the first half was one of the most craziest pieces of uh, game plan I've ever seen. And the coaching uh, was despicable because obviously playing to that plan. But in the second half, when they played a lot more attacking, um, if they played like that all game, I think they would have won the game. Kind of interesting in that I decided to have a look at who their forward line coach was. Um, for Collingwood because I wasn't sure. And I found out that their forward line coach is also responsible for their ball movement, and it's Brenton Sanderson. So, Macca, that explains perfectly what went wrong because what you were describing first off, that defensive action is their ball movement, that they decided to implement something new. Well, and we all knew what Sanderson's results up against Port were. Yep. And... and and their forward line, they actually have some really nice talent up in that forward line. I do rate Jamie Elliott um, quite a bit and Darcy Moore. I mean, he's got some really nice on him. They just do not use that forward line properly at all. And you're right, in the second half they decided to go back to how they kind of normally play and they started to get a bit of a run on. But I said in the, the thread on the um, Big Footy book, that basic, watching that game was like the visual representation of how I'm currently feeling with this flu. <laughs> it was probably fair comment. It wasn't a very good game to watch at all, and um, there's no doubt the Port are flattered by their position on the ladder by a long, long chalk. They're not, they're not, they're not of that standard. Um, yeah, well, they'll, you know, they'll be in the finals. They might even get a home final, but, gee, they, they're only a very ordinary side. Robbie Gray, outstanding effort by Robbie Gray. He's... A, very, very classy individual and a couple of others, but, gee, they're not a good side. Anyway, onwards to the game that matters, and it was Adelaide. Uh, there was a really entertaining game, I thought. I never, I don't know how you guys felt, but I never felt like we were going to get done. Um, and as a result, it was just a really enjoyable game to watch. In the end, Adelaide getting up 18 goals, 15-123, to the Bombers, 12 goals, 880, a margin of 43 points in the end, which was also, I think, the half-time margin pretty close. Um, what did you guys think? Well, I, you know, I, I thought that to some degree we allowed Essendon to dictate the style of game that it was going to be, and we went along with it. So often we would just play slightly differently if they got a little bit threatening. But um, from my point of view, I, you know, I, it was... a uh, not the type of, well, it's just another alternative type of game, I thought, rather than what we've been watching every week. Certainly not the way we normally play. I thought the way we were setting up um, from that first quarter was very much to stop Essendon's run because we know it's a fast decker Eddie had. That's the way they like to play. We were making sure they couldn't do that um, kick and mark possession game that they liked to then break the lines. We hardly ever gave them the centre. Um, so, and, and I remember the commentators were like, "Hang on, this this is looking a really defensive game. It's completely opposite what we thought." And Pike was interesting in his, in his comments afterwards that he said that it, the reason why we got so many scores from turnovers was there was so few stoppages, and he was right. Really unusual. Yeah, that's true, Nicky. And but the very very start of the game. Essendon were full of run and and uh, trying to trying to play a very very fast game and you're quite right what 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 happened after that but they did get uh, some score on the board by doing it very early in the piece I I just think that to some degree Pike looked frustrated that as if something wasn't quite working um, and that's the most animated I've seen him during a game yet we were we were leading all the way and yet so many times you look up and he was frustrated um, at what was going on. So something wasn't quite going the way he wanted to go. A couple of times when they showed him, I know it was, I think, when Knight kicked it into the... No, somebody kicked it into the centre to Knight who was actually manned up. And it's like it's fine to take that risky kick, but it's kind of got to pay off. You, you've got to have a slight advantage. And there was no advantage to that kick going to that spot. It was a stupid decision. So he was just... On screen, we're showing how I was feeling as well. There, there were some stupid decisions made by our players. Yeah, and but having said that, I thought um, 
the one good thing about it is having played it the way it was, it did show that when we exerted our class that, that we were that we we could actually change the course of the game and when it really counted and we did that several times when they challenged we'd put another gap there and they'd come again and we'd put another gap and um look I Essendon had a, a real game to go for here because that they were trying for to preserve their position in the eight and they gave it a hundred percent and uh and they had a couple of key players that missing out of their side, but to their credit, they gave it everything they had, which wasn't good enough because uh, we played better, um, although not perfectly. Um, and yeah, you know, it was a good game. It was a good game to tune us up. Um, next week it'll be a different style of game again, and the one after that will be a different style of game again. So it's good for finals to, to have all these different types of games. I felt like um, Pike was frustrated with some of our finishing. I think you're right. Uh, Nicky, the the last decision was sometimes frustrating and there were certainly some frustrating shots at goal at times. Um, but overall, I, I felt like we controlled the game for all except a portion of the second quarter when we did in fact give away the corridor. Um, Essendon decided to play kamikaze run football and uh, it took us a little while just to adjust to that. But the, the 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 pleasing thing about it all was that we did adjust to it and after about the 10 minute or just after the 10 minute mark of the second quarter um, you know uh, their run through the middle uh, had settled down because we'd been able to restructure ourselves defensively and you could tell by the back end of that quarter uh, they were rogered and uh, it allowed us to uh, kick clear again. Let's have a look at some head to head stats uh, and 387 to 377 disposals. We kicked it uh, one and a half times to one handball. Uh, 119 marks to 99. Tackles fairly even, 68-61 our way. Hitouts, 35-33. But I want to know your thoughts on on the hitout adjudi- or the rucking adjudication. I felt like Lewenberger was actually trying to date Sam Jacobs rather than actually <laughs> ruck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I hadn't thought of it quite like that, but it looked like he was, you know, more interested in getting a spot on WWW and wrestling because uh, he, he just mauled him, absolutely mauled him. Oh yeah, he was just hanging on to him. He was trying to hold his arms down at almost every rucking contest. It was so weird to to see that and it not be paid. But we know that Jacobs rarely um, gets frees. Um, The other one on top of that is Danaher. Now, he's a great talent and everything else, but he full-on puts two hands in the back of his opponents any time he goes for a mark and pushes, and he's allowed to get away with it. Um, The way that he's umpired, I think, is not fair to defenders. Yeah, Yeah. I know know what you mean, Nicky. Um, But, you know, um, he's tall and... They often, sometimes they just can't see what he's doing, I suppose. But um, just just on that rucking thing, isn't there a rule that be, when a ball's going to be thrown in that they're supposed to be two metres apart at the start? Or one metre. Or one metre. It's, it's a metre, Macca. And they do separate them, but the the very moment that the umpire lets the ball, they re-engage, uh, lets the ball go, they re-engage. What, what frustrates... Oh God, what frustrates me about the whole thing is there's a rule in football. I reckon the rule's been around for, what, 120 years? You're not allowed to hold. Now, yeah, I don't yeah. care who's holding first or if they're both holding together. There has to be a free pay. This whole umpire calling both holding, that's rubbish. Like, someone is holding and then someone is holding in retaliation. And it's a blight on the game to see two ruckmen just sit there wrestling and trying to break their arms free to give a decisive tap. And I wish they would do something about it. It's just ridiculous. Yep, and at least one occasion they were wrestling so much there was none of their forearms could be raised because they were all tangled up and the ball just lobbed to the ground. Yeah, just stupid. Anyway, uh, what else have we got here? Freeze, we uh, looked like we were getting the rub of the green and we got seven more. I, I felt like the umpiring was pretty average, uh, all told. Um, 33 scoring shots to 20 sort of illustrates our dominance in the end. Uh, again, our disposals per scoring shot is bloody fantastic, 11.7 to 18.8. 
clearances were even, 30 each. Um, rebound 50s, uh, Essendon 41 to 31, which is surprises me because I thought we got a lot of bounce off half back and certainly got we scored 96 points off turnovers or something ridiculous. Must be a world record. Uh, 47 to 62 inside 50s. Um, you know, uh, those stats without going through uh, the other ones just yet, those stats indicate that uh, we were just far more efficient with the ball. Well, we and then, and we were as well. We we definitely were, um, and we had you know we'll talk about later the individuals, but some of the in, individuals uh, must have gone at pretty high percentages, I think. Yeah, there were. Yeah, uh, contested posies. We uh, got on top one forty four, one twenty seven. Uh, uncontested, pretty even. Uh, effective disposals. We went at seventy six point seven. They went at seventy two point seven, which is probably indicative of the fast deck, although um, I felt our field kicking was fantastic. Um, 24 contested marks to 11, and 22 marks inside 50 to 8. That uh, stat right there is one of a couple of stats that I wanted to highlight. Our ability to stretch them inside 50, and also just to find targets inside 50 was a, was a key difference. Um, on that, I heard Josh Jenkins interviewed on Triple M today and they asked him, you know, about the whole thing of, um, you know, his contested marking and, like, getting some marks over Hurley that he got. And he said that what's happened this year is that Teague's had a chat with both him and Tex and they are not allowed to use the excuse that they get their arms wrapped up by their defender. They have to fight that. They have to make sure they can get to the contest. Teague is not going to accept um, that I got wrapped up um, and so then the third man can come across, etc. So that's what he and Tex specifically have been working on with Teague a lot this year. He also said something which I thought was really interesting was that you have to play as a forward how the defence is letting you. And because last year he and Eddie spent more time a little bit closer to goal, but their def- all the other defences against us are now manning up that area, what, we were, what we've now started to do is lead up to the ball instead. And so Josh is spending a lot more time up the ground um, because of that and leading at the ball. But I thought those were t- two really interesting well, points. Well, I will say about Jenkins... I- you know, we're often critical about his lack of overhead marking, but he took some strong marks on the, on the weekend. One thing I'll say about Hurley is that he's being played out of position, and I know it's because of his size, uh, but for a bloke to lead their possession count and yet essentially be towed up in his KPI, which is stopping his opponent, um, Hurley is about as good at one-on-one contesting as Jake Lever, in my opinion. <laughs> Yep, good point. Oh, I think oh. he's a star footballer. There's no doubt about that. He's a very, very good player. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you probably, but they put him there because he is that good player that he can you know, get a lot of the ball and and clear it. But and uh, you put a lesser player there, maybe the scores might be a lot higher against them. But um, it would it'd be a lovely luxury to be able to play him either somewhere around the middle or at half forward. The oh, talk. Think- the talk, Sorry, the, talk is, Macca. Um, the talk is Macca that he doesn't want to play forward. He wants to play down back, and he refuses to go up forward. Yeah, they want him. They want him down back, but I think he uh, needs. They they actually need another key position defender, so that he can be a little bit of an Alex Rance type. Um, uh, we saw Alex Rance get towed up by Harry Taylor uh, in similar circumstances, and those type of players. Uh, they're playmakers and they're not accountable and they're not terribly good overhead uh, in one-on-one situations. And uh, what the Bombers need is a, is a, another big guy down back to allow Hurley to play that intercept third tall because he does get a lot of the ball and he does use it pretty well um, and it would give them some more versatility. Uh, going through the last of the um, stats uh, was... Uh, so the other, the other um, I mean... Centre clearance is 14 to 16. Stoppage clearance is 16 to 14. It was a pretty close tussle. But this is an interesting stat and one that I wanted to highlight. 
uh, Essendon, score involvements, Essendon 91, Adelaide 150. What that tells me is that we just moved the ball around the ground uh, at will and uh, we were able to break Essendon's defence open by spreading well and then going in inside uh, with the right option, whereas uh, Essendon tended to uh, kick and hope a little bit. I can't add to that. I think that's a very good summary of it. Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, th- I think it was a combination of our ability to uh, break even at the contest, um, our efficiency with foot uh, by foot in particular, uh, our ability to spread and uh, get lots of people involved in scoring chains and then to hit the right target at the end. Um, and certainly uh, being able to uh, catch them on the turnover so often al- allowed us just to slice through them. And some of the chain of uh, ball movements from the back half were just, it was champagne footy at times. To the point where it made the game look ridiculously easy. Obviously it's not because, you know, the guys that have uh, spread and have probably run their guts out to get to those positions to you know to make even if it's only to make a vacancy for the other players to go into but uh it look it does look ridiculously easy at times which just shows you how well drilled we are um and that's completely on the the coaching group for setting that up and then trusting the players to carry it out yeah, yeah. I- I hope we can retain Teague. I think he's going to be a bit of a target. I think it's also indicative of how hard our players are working at the moment too because we do get numbers behind the ball at times and we force those turnovers and then we've always got options. Very rarely do you see us held up in transition because we don't have anything up forward. We've always got options. And that takes a hell of a lot of running power uh, and a hell of a lot of discipline to go when it's your turn and... uh, I think that's a real key uh, to our success at the moment is the fact that we can we can get back defensively, but with ball in hand, um, we uh, we're not lazy with it as well in terms of making position going forward. It's going to be interesting to see what happens against a team like Sydney, who are very well structured defensively as well, because it's not often over the last month or so that those uh, forward chains get broken. Uh, but Sydney have the capability of, of chopping us out and then catching us uh, out of position. So uh, it'll be interesting to see whether we try and play a slower brand of football or more defensive and, and uh, in tight game of football against Sydney or whether we chance our arm. Yeah, I think Sydney is going to be a major test in every aspect of the game because um, Sydney, uh, if you look at their team, and they're not relying on stars. They're just relying on very good team footy and... Uh, and they they were a very tough team as well. They go in very hard for the ball. Um, and then they've had hard edge that they, they've been saying that we've had lately, which I think is true. But you know, Sydney have always had this hard edge. That's something something they're very good at. So yeah, they'll be a real test. And in, and as you said earlier, this will tell us a lot. I I think it will. I think that what we've been setting up and what we've been working towards is so that we can match it with Sydney. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, Nikki. I think uh, um, certainly the the harder edge that we've been playing over the last month uh, is indicative of a side that uh, needed to step up because it was one of the areas that we were lacking in the past. Um, you know, whether we've got, got it to uh, take it up to probably what I would say is the hardest midfield in the comp. Melbourne are pretty hard as well, but Sydney, I think, are the hardest midfield in the comp physically uh, remains to be seen um, but I'm less unconfident if that's the right terminology than I was maybe six weeks ago um, <laughs> I think it's not confident but it doesn't matter um, are, you, are you saying that you're more confident than you were six weeks ago I'm, that's what I'm saying although I'm not I, I wouldn't say that I'm confident but I'm not as not confident as I was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alex, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, We're creating new words on the Crowcast. I'm looking, I, got, I, I understand where you're coming from. And um, yeah, if you're talking about like maybe six weeks ago, we might have been doubtful, but 
Um, we, look, we've uh, been priming our game to, to play, I think, against Sydney. I think you're quite right about that and uh, because they have been the measuring stick for some time in terms of the, the way, that that hard edge and the way they play. Um, and, yeah, you know, if we can beat a Sydney, well, then you've got every chance of winning a flag. Well, the thing is, Macca, they've been our measuring stick. I mean, we've, we've been able to beat GWS simply because I believe that we work harder than GWS, uh, particularly defensively. Uh, you know, we've been able to match it with Geelong except down at Skilled uh, and I think at the moment we would feel that we've now come up with a game plan that can uh, can uh, um, t- defeat the Cats. Uh, Sydney the ones and uh, I wouldn't mind betting that our club thinks that it'll be Sydney in the GF if we get that far um, but we've certainly build a game plan so that we don't turn up against Sydney like we did in the final last year, which is all you can really ask for. That was embarrassing the way we turned up. We just got brushed aside as if we weren't there right at the start. And that's exactly what we'll be, we'll be trying to prevent against in future. Well, and into that, we'll go into some uh, individual stats because uh, uh, it was, again, our midfield that really stepped up. Matty Crouch, 35 disposals, 13 and 22 uh, the four tackles, a couple of inside 50s, seven clearances, three rebound 50s, 20 contested possessions, if you don't mind, 82.9% disposal efficiency, if you don't mind, uh, got four out of the middle uh, and nine score involvements. Uh, just a complete game again from Matt Crouch. How can he not be all Australian? I mean, his form is outstanding. And when you uh, measure him against uh, the other big guns, He's second in disposals, and he's better than the majority of them. And he's also, so I mean, the the one who's got those disposals is Tom Mitchell, and yet his meters gained is so far ahead of Mitchell. It isn't funny, um, because he's actually proactive instead of just handballing to somebody close to him. Except for last night when he kept trying to give it to his brother, who had a dog of a game. It was like once he stopped giving it to Brad, things got better. Um, I. I'm still in two minds as to whether he was best on ground or whether it was Smith. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, that's a fair to the coin, and I think that's just a matter of opinion because Brody Smith been best on ground and Matty Crouch could have been best on ground, you know, whichever one you think, and, and nobody's gonna, nobody, nobody can say you're wrong. Well, I, I thought Matt was consistent over the four quarters. I thought Brody had a, a very good first half but an excellent second half. Um, as certainly in the third quarter uh, when Essendon were making one of their little runs. Brody certainly uh, made some really telling plays that kept us in the game. His uh, stats, 23 disposals, 15 and 8, uh, 9 marks, uh, which has really become a feature of his game, actually, Brody Smith's marking. Five tackles as well, three inside 50s, five rebound 50s, uh, went at 82.6%, had 10... What the hell is B.O.? <laughs> oh, ten bounces. <laughs> ten bounces. I thought they were. Uh, never mind. Ten bounces, eight scoring involvements, and uh, five intercepts as well. Uh, played eighty-five percent time on ground as well. Uh, it was probably, uh, I reckon, almost Brody's best game for the season. Well, I, I think it was his best game for the season because he also played it fairly tough. He, he never shirked any issues either. He played. Uh, um, Quite a physical game, I thought, by his standards, the way he played. Um, yeah, no, it looked a top effort, and uh, yeah, as I said, you could easily argue he was the best player. You could easily argue that Maddie, Maddie was, and you look at their um, efficiency percentages, both outstanding. I loved his hit on Tip and Woody um, that he did, which then resulted in Atkins' goal. But I think what was so pleasing um, for in terms of of how he was playing was that he was minding Tip and Woody when he was up the ground and Brown had him when he was closer to goal. But that did not stop him from then attacking. And he kept Tip and Woody pretty much out of the game because they needed Tip and Woody to left. Tip and Woody had Brownie first who gave him absolutely nothing. Brownie, I love Brownie, he's just a miserly backman. He just doesn't like letting his man have a touch. And poor old Tippin Woody would have been starving. And the SEN player ratings only gave Brown like a six. He went, oh, he did his job. 
This is so <laughs> unassuming, Lukey Brown. He, like, uh, but the, there are moments in games where Luke Brown is one out against a dangerous player, and he very rarely lets you down, uh, and he's invaluable uh, in that back half. Brody, so the other value of Brody Smith is just his metres gained. 575 metres gained uh, is just outstanding. And uh, That was 100. Sorry? Was that, was that 100 more than the next player? Uh, yes, the next player was Rory with 457, Rory Atkins. Um, and when you've got two running players that can combine for over a 1,000 metres gained, uh, that's invaluable. And let's just talk about Rory quickly. He had 16 kicks, 11 handballs for 27. He took seven marks, kicked a goal, uh, six inside 50s. Uh, he also went at 92.6% disposal efficiency with 11 contested possessions. Uh, two goal assists, um, two. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> These new stats are killing me. Eight score involvements, uh, uh, eight intercepts as well, and as I mentioned, 457 um, metres gained. Um, when the game is fast like that, Rory, uh, Rory Atkins really comes into his own, um, and uh, it's probably the game probably suited him, I, I felt, this week. I would have accepted if he just said he'd done good. <laughs> I thought he played a terrific game, actually. That's, uh, I've been very critical of his last couple of games that I thought they uh, weren't quite where he should have been, and I thought that uh, he, and a couple of times he was quite physical the way he went about the ball. Other times when he did some very fancy dance steps, but I thought he played a very, very, very good game. His disposal efficiency speaks for itself, and uh, yeah, he was a real weapon. Uh, for me, I think because it was such that up and back that you're right, Phoenix, that type of game style suits an outside runner, which is what he's there for. But um, I really loved what we've seen from him the past couple of weeks, and we've talked about it before. When he was having that down patch, he wasn't getting back in defence so much and helping out. We, we seemed to – we were either setting up differently or we weren't being as we on in terms of our defensive action as we had – because he's now getting down back, that gives him more space to then actually run further up the ground. I, I, I think that's kind of what um, helps him. Um, and I just think that he was on from the start. Yeah. He seemed to have that little mindset of like, nah, this is my game, I'm yeah, going to take it. Yeah, he was on. You tell. You're quite right, Nicky. Um, the other games, he he's looked like he was struggling to participate. But but this time, it looked like he was, yeah, this is my game, as you said. Now, Richie Douglas is another one that's had a real, uh, enjoying a real rich vein of form at the moment. 23 disposals, 14 and 9. Took six marks, kicked a couple of goals, um, a couple of inside 50s, uh, again, 11 contested at 82.6% efficiency, 10 score involvements, uh, nearly 400 metres gained, and five intercepts as well. Um, doesn't it add to our midfield when we've got Richard Douglas being able to work his way into the game like that, not only in the midfield, but also working his way up, up forward and, and uh, hitting the scoreboard? He's invaluable. I mean, he, he's uh, he, he's playing and actually uh, one, one of his best years this year. And, uh, uh, you know, they wondered where we're going to get our depth from the midfield. Well, he put his hand, you know, he put his hand up and I reckon he's been... Quite some weeks in a row now. He's been a... most importantly for me. He's kicking goals, which is what you want from a midfielder. I mean, we've got a ridiculous forward line, but when you can also put him up forward as the resting midfielder, some he's dangerous around that area. He is. Too. I think that's a really good point, Nikki. The fact that he hits any midfielder that hits a scoreboard is invaluable because it just. Again, it's another thing that the opposition coach and the opposition team have to worry about. And uh, Richie's been good for one or two a game over the last month and uh, it, it really adds uh, to our depth through that midfield rotation. And, and Maka, you know, we were right to question our, our midfield depth at the beginning of the year and, and, and in parts during the season. And, you know, I, I think... What we were screaming for is blokes like Richie Douglas and David McKay uh, and those, you know, more senior players and Brad Crouch as well, who's not a senior player but certainly a, a highly rated player, 
to step up, you know, and what we're actually seeing is exactly what we what we wanted. So, and what these guys have been able to show, and what the team's been able to show is when everyone is at at peak form and playing well, we're very hard to stop. Yeah, look, that's a very good point because first of all, we didn't have Brad Crouch right at the beginning of the season. It looked pretty paper thin at the beginning of the season, but um, Brad's. Uh, he didn't have a really good one this week, but that he, he's been building very nicely before that. Uh, Richie Douglas has been, he, he, ste- he has stepped up and he's having one of his really good seasons. And David McKay is actually playing very good hard footy and yeah, he'll, do, he'll make an error here and there, and, but so do all the others. And uh, I, he's having the best season for a long time as well and uh, contributing. Plus, Hugh Greenwood, we, you know, he's come... Uh, out of nowhere, and uh, he's he, a really hard edge, and he wins some very hard balls. He's got very good quick hands in close and tight, and uh, yeah, it's a turning into a good midfield. Yep, I, I agree, and, and um, you know, I, let's talk about DMAC quickly because I think the thing the, the thing that I've noticed about DMAC, and I think he has benefited from the confidence that the coaching panel and the selection panel have showed in him. He's playing with a with a steely determination that I don't think I've ever actually seen from David McKay. And I think it stems from a bit of self-belief. And I think credit has to go to the coaching staff against every pundit on Big Footy that they have stuck fat with him and they've obviously given him roles and clear instructions. But he's now playing like a, a determined senior player in the team and you know 19 touches again this week with the five marks he laid seven tackles uh three inside 50s um only the six contested but he is our outside runner but he went at 84 percent again uh seven score involvements 400 meters gained um it's exactly the type of game that we want from david and he's been delivering more consistently over the last month than i that i can remember him delivering yep no 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 argument for me, and uh, and he's had seasons before where he's deserved the criticism that he's got, and perhaps he was given a luxury in some times in the past. But you know, you got to you got to talk, talk about the present because that's all that really matters in in footy. Uh, and at the moment, he's uh, more than earning his spot in the side. For me, what I loved was not just his tackles, but pretty much the whole team. That tackling technique last night was impeccable um and i love the the couple of his he was able to get those players down to the ground now um he still looks like he's an 18 year old but that core strength and and that technique was just perfect it is a little bit um as phoenix said though he looks he does look like he's got a very steely resolve at the moment. And uh, even, I saw a couple of times there were people trying to knock him around a bit and he, he didn't put up with back. And, uh, yeah, he, he's not playing like a soft wimp, which is sometimes what he had been accused of in the past. He's, he's playing good, tough footy. Uh, interesting, Nicky, because I agree with you. Our, te- our tackling technique was fantastic. And, and what I've noticed, when we do uh, manage to pin arms, we're not slinging. We're actually... We're dropping, uh, which, you know, every this is something that makes me laugh about this whole sling tackle thing. People go on and say, oh, you know, that's how kids are taught to tackle. They're not actually taught to sling. They're actually taught to drop at the knees when you grab a, a guy in a tackle like that. And what I've noticed that we do more often than not is exactly that. We do bring our body weight down, which brings the opponent to the ground without actually having any sideways force. And there are a couple of times where we tackled so well with the arms pinned that the Essendon player was basically looking at the umpire going, well, shit, I can't do anything. It was just that good. Yeah, I mean, we were, at least a couple were lying there looking like stunned mullet staring at the umpire and waiting for to blow the whistle and let them get out of this misery. Yeah, it was almost like a submission hold. Um who else have we got here? Uh, Tommy Lynch again, a, a, a power of a game running up and down. Uh, cock, cock, eight, six. Yeah, he will get a cock womble, but we'll talk about that in a minute. He, 17 disposals, uh, eight marks, uh, kicked a goal, uh, had three tackles as well. Um, uh, four inside 50s for Tommy Lynch, uh, went at 76.5%. Uh, 
efficiency, had 11 score involvements, which is his strength to our team. Just another solid performance from Lynchy, apart from the worst. And Rory Sloan uh, confirmed on game day this morning that he has taken over the mantle from Richie Douglas as the worst miss in club history. Couldn't see how he missed it, but he did. Um, yeah. The shocker. I, I think that was quite, quite funny because you revealed the little chat that he and Sauce were actually having in the centre of the ground about how to set up. And then as soon as they saw a miss, they just went, shit, this is going to come. Yeah, quick. exactly. They were completely out of position. <laughs> uh, it was a shocker. And, uh, you know, it would have been a terrible miss under uh, more, uh, a closer game. Uh, but he could have a chuckle about it. But, geez, Lynchy, come on. He, he nearly tripped over trying to kick that ball, actually. Um, Huey Greenwood, as we mentioned before, just adds another dimension. And I thought he actually added another dimension to his own game on uh, Saturday night with some of his marking. Had 16 touches, 6 and 10, but took 7 marks and a couple of really good ones as well. Had the 3 clearances, uh, the 6 contested possessions, uh, 4 marks inside 50 and uh, 8 score involvements. It looked as if we were playing him in a little bit more of an attacking fashion this week. Yeah, and he, he, he took he, um, he took a couple of strong marks, and um, you saw after the game he was showing his wingspan, which is some ridiculous wingspan he's got with these long, long arms. Two hundred and four centimeters. His arms are longer than I am. <laughs> your your arms, your wingspan is supposed to be the same as your height, and his wingspan exceeds his height by thirteen centimeters, and it's something that we've su- uh, pardon me suspected, uh, given that he's he's able to uh, to intercept those close in handballs so often. But thirteen centimeters over the average wingspan like to height ratio is just incredible. He's built like a frog. <laughs> Like really, really long arms, short body, long arms. And that good, Look, I thought off the rest, um, I felt our defence as a unit was pretty good. We've talked about Lukey Brown. Uh, I thought Kelly played well. Lever uh, was found a little bit wanting when uh, Pikey, I thought, quite shrewdly put him one on one with Danaher. Um, but also, but did some good things uh, in his normal intercept role. Um, I felt like uh, Tiles uh, did okay, although he struggled to run with Hooker at times. I st- I'm wondering whether we might actually give him a week off this week. Um, but overall, I thought our back six did really well. Um, can we I can felt- we give some mention to Keith's game on Danaher when he was on? Yeah, yeah I was going to mention it myself because I don't think Danaher got a goal while he was standing Keith. Nope. Well, Alex Keith, Keith took a, a, a team high eleven marks, uh, which was equal with Josh. Uh, had uh, eighteen disposals, eleven marks, a couple of tackles. Uh, and down, and down. Yeah, ninety four percent disposal efficiency, seven one percenters, four score involvements. And what I liked about Alex's game was his one on one work. There were times when he was terribly out of position because of a fast entry and yet he was able to hold his ground. And uh, I like his technique of using his opposite hand to uh, to spoil when he's caught in front of an opponent. Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent technique. Yeah, oh, hang he... on. He's a left footer. Is he left-handed? So he actually could be using his dominant hand then. It might be his dominant hand, but generally speaking, what you will do, will use you'd use the hand that is closest to the your opponent rather than basically go side on and use your opposite hand. But what he's actually doing is keeping touch on his opponent as the opponent's running back uh, with with that closest hand and then having the awareness to have the other arm up uh, to intercept or spoil the ball. It's a unique technique and it works very well for him. Now, it was really um, interesting. There was a bit of discussion today regarding um, the way he defends in that he doesn't, grapple he doesn't hang on he stands off um the play and a few people didn't like that and I counted it with he's not strong enough or has the knowledge to do that grappling etc because he knows he's quick because he knows he's got quite a good reach and a good jump he can stand off that little bit 
um, and like you just said, either hold off with one hand or he can then come in and intercept mark or punch. It means he's not being held down by that forward and outbodied. Well, I was absolutely super impressed with his game, um, super impressed. And uh, to the point that I was thinking to myself, well, you've got Talia, you've got Lever. Does Hardigan get back and take his place? Because at the moment, I think he's playing very good footy. Yeah, I don't know whether Hardo gets back in. I think Hardo might have some issues still with his hamstring. Um, the thing about what you were saying, Nick, uh, with Alex is, as a defender, there's two ways that you can defend. And if you decide to engage uh, physically, the danger is that the forward can push off you, uh, which means that not only does he gain a yard, but it takes you two or three uh, then to catch up, and it's nigh and impossible. But by essentially... Um, relying on your ability to read the ball yourself and engage in a genuine one-on-one contest. Um, the forward doesn't have that ability to push off you or to uh, grapple with you and, you know, limit your ability to spoil the ball. You know, not there. Are, I think uh, Rance is one that does that a bit. Uh, Josh Gibson's another one that tends to do that a bit. You won't see Josh Gibson grappling very often. Um, and I think it suits Keith's... Uh, uh, strengths very well is speed and uh, his ability to to jump and and, uh, read the play. Great coaching from Pods. He's certainly a much, much better player than I I expected him to be. I saw him a few times in the um, uh, snaffle and uh, quite frankly I think he's playing better with the big boys than he did down there. How often is that the case though, Maka? Yep. He, he, He just has risen to the level, hasn't he? Yeah, I thought Brad Crouch had a quiet game. It seemed to have a fit of the fumbles, uh, Bradley, for whatever reason, but uh, given that he's had a month of really good form, we'll let him off on that one. I felt like uh, Riley Knight was a bit quiet. Uh, The danger, I think, with Knighter is that he can uh, drift in and out of games and needs to probably find a way to get involved a bit more often. Charlie Cameron's an interesting one. How did you guys see his game? 13 touches, 6 marks. Uh, six tackles, nine inside 50s, um, but only went at 38.5% disposal efficiency, had five score involvements, uh, but committed seven turnovers. Funny old game from Charlie, and, he, and I'm still convinced that there's something going on in the background with him at the moment. Well, you know, the rumours are that he wants to go home to Brisbane, even though he's contracted for next year. And maybe that's reflected in his form a little bit, certainly up and down. I actually liked his game better than Knight's. Um, I thought, even though, yeah, he had those turnovers, a lot of his stuff was a lot more proactive and was smarter in terms of where he was um, deciding to try and, and kick to, etc. cetera. Um, had some really good marking contests as well as um, Barty Magic has just pointed out. So um, for me, this was actually one of his better games than what we've seen at the moment. Um, so I was kind of pleased to see that he was working his way into the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nikki, I, I felt like Charlie had more of an impact on the game than the Nida. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at key in key parts of the ground and at key moments, uh, a couple of his marks were really, really solid. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, as the, the knock on Charlie is always that he doesn't get enough uh, involvement. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to know where he's actually being played and what his role is. But, you know, it wasn't the worst game we've seen from Charlie. Um, I just wish he'd look a little bit happier. I I kind of feel bad for the guy because he doesn't look happy at the moment. Well, he he apparently is homesick, and maybe that's what's showing. Uh, Eduardo was another quiet one, uh, although he did... uh, you know, threatened to cause havoc up forward, but he only had the seven touches. Channel, uh, and he's he, really happy uh, in the change rooms from my he source. Only kicked, what he, he only kicked the one behind. He had four tackles, four clangers as well. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, sometimes it's a game for our tall forwards and sometimes it's a game for our small forwards. Um, and it looked to me as if it just wasn't the type of game that Eddie could really get that much involved. Yeah, we've got to be honest, though. His opponent, young Andrew McGrath, who, who's, I think, wasn't he the number one draft pick? 
Um, he had 25 disposals, and I thought played a terrific game for Essendon. I actually thought Eddie was going to have a quiet game because we saw with Lynch when he came back, he had that really good first up game and then he had the drop off in the second game. Eddie's come back, he's had that really good first off game and I thought that, yep, yeah, this is the second game is going to find him out. I'm not, I'm not distressed by the fact that he had a quiet game, by the way, because, I mean, the man's not a machine. He just can't do it every week. So good, good, better for him to have it off this week and uh, bring the goodies uh, to it. Uh, Adelaide Oval on uh, next weekend. I mean, seriously, though, if all of our forward line actually lives up to their expectations every game, like all of them, holy crap, our 112-point average is going to go up considerably. It's going to be at <laughs> least 150 or 160. No, you're quite, <laughs> quite right, Nicky. Um, but, uh, and I, I think we have to be honest and, and give credit where it's due and give um, young McGrath a pat on the back for us. And I thought he played... Um, an outstanding game, and I thought he beat any uh, one-on-one several occasions. Yeah, I, I, I didn't actually have the impression that McGrath, I mean, he obviously was, but I never got the sense that Eddie was being blanketed by McGrath. Yeah, um, yeah neither. So, and look, I'm with you, Nicky, because footy just doesn't work that way. You can't have six forwards all kicking five goals. It just, footy never works that way. You know, we've, at times we've had Gov bob up for three or four. We've had Jenkins bob up for three or four. We've had Tex bob up for a bag or Eddie, you know. And generally speaking, we'll get one of the one or two of those guys. And it, and it often relies on how the ball's coming in, how how the defence is playing against our forwards. And uh, to me, it just didn't appear as, as as though Eddie had that many opportunities. We've got to remember that he is just an opportunist small forward. Correct. He, he's, Correct. No. He's, he's not Gary Ablett. Um, and I just don't think the game particularly lent itself to a highlights package from Eddie uh, this week. Well, and there, and there certainly wasn't one. Um, but uh, as I said before, I, everyone's going to have a quiet game now and again, and I'd rather it be this particular game rather than, rather than next week. So that um, leaves um, us... Are sorry, we, we going to have a chat about McGovern? Yeah, go ahead. Because I actually, as you just pointed out there, we've had him bob up. And, I mean, he should have had four goals. Um, and you're quite right in that we haven't lost a game without him. I mean, to me, he is now the most important one we need to keep out of him and Lever. Um, and I hope the rumours are true that he's agreed to terms. Um, I thought his movement was really nice. There was some great, Was it, yeah, it was an Atkins kick. That um that he kicked it to him was superb, um, but I, yeah, just his presence down there really really worried that Essendon defence. Just on Lever, um, perhaps our coach uh, put him on down her just to get him beaten now and again, so he well, he might settle for less money. Realise he's not as good as he thought he was. Well, you know, I mean, we all love uh, Jakey, uh, and we love the way he plays. But I must admit that some of the comments that have been coming from him over the last few weeks are of a lad that is pretty comfortable with his own ability, but perhaps has, may have just got ahead of himself a little bit. That's all right. That's all right. And the cynic in me wouldn't mind betting that Pikey chucked him back on, on Big Joey just for a little while, just to see how he's going, but... I don't know whether that's something that in the heat of the in the heat of a game you would actually do, but as whether it was intentional or or just you know in the normal course of events, whenever Jake does find himself in one on one contests, he does struggle. He struggled against Kerno, he struggled against other players at times, and he certainly struggled against Danaher. Although that's no, you know, Danaher's no easy task anyway, um, but. You know, I guess if he's going to move, and if a team's going to pay seven fifty for essentially a rebounding halfback flanker who can intercept, you know, good luck to him, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that Nicky said I think if we have to keep one, it would have to be McGovern. I think because I think Keith is showing that we can uh, we maybe not at the same level, but we can replace him, uh, Lever, at, at a, much more ad- adequately. 
uh, really good forwards like McGovern, they don't come along very often. I'm glad you've come around to my thinking, Maka, because I've been saying McGovern over Lever all season for that very reason, that you t- blokes like that just don't come along very often, and having the three of them up there, just it's impossible to match up on. And it's not as if... like Each of those three players could hold down a key post in their own right. The fact that we've got three of them just makes it nigh on impossible to keep them all down. Yeah, no, you have. Well, I'm not saying it was you particularly who persuaded me, but now I have come around to the same uh, by sheer observation that uh, um, Lever at times looks mortal, and uh, McGovern, on the other hand, um, yeah, well, while he's mortal, he can do something freakish that which, which will win you games. Yeah, he. The only knock I have on Gov at the moment is that he he can sometimes drop the ones that he shouldn't drop, uh, the easy ones. Um, and I think that's just a concentration thing more than anything else. But uh, talk about being able to make something happen. Uh, he, he's the one for mine. Him and Eddie up forward are the two that can make things happen, govern the air and, and Eddie at ground level. The interesting thing is that perhaps McGovern has been having uh, more of a wrestle in his own mind and, and hopefully he's come to a conclusion on that. Lever, on the other hand, is uh, you wouldn't think there was any... Uh, doubt about what's going on with him because he just uh, you know he's so confident in off off the ground and uh, confident on the ground that you you think that he's made his mind up one way or the other I'm not convinced Lever's going I'm I'm actually in the stay camp I I don't think Lever's going Uh, I certainly think he's been entertaining offers and I think a lot of that is to uh, maximise his own contract but I don't actually think he's going because uh, the thing that, that makes me think that apart from uh, you know the mixed messages that we've been getting in the media is that he's a competitive bastard and he's currently in a team that looks like it's going to be in the premiership hunt for the next couple of years and uh, I don't think Jake would actually forgive himself if he left an organisation in the position that we're in at the moment uh, for a club that you know, like Collingwood or someone like that, who may not compete for the next five or six years. Well, that's a very valid point, and uh, time will be the answer to that. Um, I hope they both stay because it's just sheer talent, you know, between the two of them. But um, I am starting to swing around into the fact that probably more important to keep McGovern. Yeah, I, yeah, that's that's kind of like where I'm at. I'm, I'm like you, Phoenix, in that I've seen him um, sitting at SNFL games and how involved he gets with them. You know, you've got other players that sit there looking on Facebook or whatever because it's like, oh, we're here, but I don't really need to watch the game. But he's just full on into it. He is such a competitive bugger. Yeah, certainly is. Um, and look, let's hope we keep them both, and let's hope we keep them both for the next five years. Because uh, you know, all all, uh, all speculation aside, they're integral to our team, and and they both make such a difference. And uh, I'd certainly made no dis- disrespect to to Jakey because he's so dynamic off half back, and his intercepting and his ability to uh, to sell a bit of candy is invaluable off that half back line, and. Uh, hopefully decides that uh, the impending success or the possible success with this group uh, is worth hanging around for. Yep, as I say, all we, all, we, all we can say is time will be the answer. And that brings us to the end of the weekend wrap, I reckon. Uh, we're just over the hour mark. It's been a good night. Uh, I think, uh, in summary for me, it was a serviceable win. We did what, what we needed to do. I don't think... Uh, we got out a second or third gear for much of the night, and yet we won by 43 points. And it finds us top of the table with two rounds to go. Just one player we didn't mention, Rory Sloan. Um, and he's got that, uh, also he got a bag on his leg. He was on the Channel 7 this morning uh, on the 10 o'clock show, and he was saying that um, he thinks he'll be right for the weekend. And uh, they had some woman up there who is an expert on injury and uh, with the way that Roy described it and with all the ice he's doing, etc. Et uh, he apparently should be available for next week. Oh, I wouldn't mind betting he misses a week. I reckon a lot's going to depend on how it comes up tomorrow, Macca. Um, he did give that uh, that ligament 
on the outside of his knee, a fair old stretch. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. They might decide to give him a rest. Uh, well, if you take Pike at his uh, face value, and I, and I must admit he's always generally told the truth so far, um, he was saying he's got no intention of resting any player that's fit enough to play. No, what I'm saying is he might not be fit enough to play. Yeah. He did also say, Macca, that if they're not right and they need to be rested, then we will also yeah, do that. And, J- and JJ actually backed that up um, in his Triple M interview today where he actually said um, that last year he had a bit of the ankle injury. He kept playing on last year and he just was not fit for finals. If it's a case of um, this year... They're talking about it. He w- and, and if he, he had an injury, um, a bit like that again this year, he would be the first one to put his hand up and say, "Yep, I need." Was a rest. anybody else that got injured in, in this game? Well, we had uh, text, 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 text foot. Yeah, you're right, Nikki. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, text with his foot right at the beginning. Uh, uh, JJ seemed to tweak a knee, uh, tweak an ankle, uh, but didn't seem hampered by it. Uh, towards he, the end he of the was, game. Yeah, he was a little um, tentative in that second quarter um, and because he tweaked it at the start of the second quarter. You can actually see there's a, a contest on the, the boundary line. He actually put his hands down to it. And so I noticed that quarter he was quite tentative, but in the in the third and definitely in the last, he, he worked quite well um, out of it. So I think he'll be fine. Yeah, but that was... Well, so we're saying the only player in doubt then is uh, Rory? Probably. Yeah, I would think so. And don't forget too, Macker, it's a six-day break this week. We play on the Friday night, so uh, that just makes it a little bit more difficult for Rory to get up. And, uh, you know, we don't really need to win this game. Uh, it'd be great to win this game. Uh, but I don't actually think that Pike is going to show all his cards anyway. Um and uh, I wouldn't mind betting that we actually uh, err on the side of caution with Sloney. I, I guess in, to some degree, and I know it's very hard to depict how uh, how it's going to finish up with the final four, um, but it, do you think that the Pikey would have a particular team that he may prefer to play first up and, and help position himself by either winning or losing the games to do that? I think with the unpredictability of what's happened this season, you can't try and engineer that. Not We're playing on Friday night. No. I mean, don't. We, we do have the advantage of the last game, of course. I've never, ever seen a coach try to manufacture an outcome where we avoid a team in the finals, Macca. That's almost like admitting defeat. Oh, there's nothing like an easy ride to get there. No, no absolutely no, quite... bullshit. Yeah, see, what I liked was what Blighty did against that North Melbourne game because he knew we were going to play them in finals. And so what he did, and even though we got spanked that game, but he tried some things so he could see how North would react, how their coaching staff would react. And he then implemented stuff in the grand final because he knew what they were going to do and we were unpredictable to them. All right, well, yeah, we'll see what happens anyhow, because, um, as I say, we, uh, I think he will play Sloan if Sloan is, is available. Yeah, well, he'll play him if he's available. The question is, will he be available, Maker? That's the question. He's got six days to get up. He's going to be very sore boy tomorrow, I would have thought, and uh, that leaves him... He'll, he'll basically be off the track all week recovering, I would imagine. Um, yeah, interestingly, I, I think... um, on the Crow Show today, they showed what we've been doing last week and what we're going to be doing this week as well as we've started using the cryotherapy. So instead of using the ice bath, we're actually going into these chambers that take it to some ridiculous minus um, whatever, and we've been doing that specifically for these two games because we've got the two six-day breaks and it aids recovery in those knocks so much quicker. 
So, so is it the does the whole player go in, or just just their engine part? No, the whole player goes in there. They like have to wear little face masks. Um, they often have little beanies on their heads because you just get so cold. It's something ridiculous, like minus a hundred and something, or whatever. And you're just only in there for four minutes. And what and that what- does is just lowers the the body temperature um, so much that and it actually helps with the healing quicker. Anyway, we can talk about that on Tuesday night. My internet's starting to die, uh, or yours is, or something, Nikki, I don't know. And we're into our hour of 10, so uh, let's call it a night. And uh, I don't have any outro music again. <laughs> uh, but thanks, Nikki and Maka, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us on the chat. Uh, obviously, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at AFL Crowcast. And we will... Oh, don't forget to listen to the Crowbar Boys uh, sometime... Uh, over the next 24 hours, they'll be uploading their take on the weekend's events, and we will be back with Peter J on Tuesday night with Tuesday Night Live. See you, everyone. Yeah, good night, all. Night.